the first uh, employee that we had was uh, my wife Sue, <laughs> and she's terrific, of course. Uh, shortly after that, um, uh, one of the engineers I worked with at the university came on board, Ron Schultz, and he's still with us. Uh, uh, see him every day. Um, after that, uh, other folks came on board, uh, Mark and Jane Turner, the, uh, Kevin Colwell, uh, Barbara Dreyfus. Uh, there's a long litany of people who've come on board. They like what they do. They're making a real contribution. Uh, they found a way where they can both make a living and make a contribution at the same time, and I think that's the magic formula. We've had uh, people on staff, and do have people on staff, I think, from, from uh, just about every disability community that there is. Um, we try to accommodate whatever need a person has so that they can do the good things that they're capable of. Uh, and I believe that we wind up with absolutely the best, the most loyal, most productive employees that you can imagine just by accommodating a few simple things. You, I think when you realize that there's a need and you have a way to help, and you can, you just do it. Um, I can't really imagine doing anything else. I mean, once you're aware of what's going on out there, and I kind of look at the things that we do. We, we have invented some new technologies, but in many, many cases, what we do is we're sort of the, um, the catalyst. Uh, we, we look at the issues that uh, communicative disorders that people have, not only from the deaf community, but also from other communities uh, where people have physical disabilities that it causes them to have problems communicating. And we look for ways where that can be resolved using either existing technologies or with maybe a tweak here and there. Okay. While I was a teenager, um, I did work for a, a while out at the what was that, then was called the Central Colony. Uh, we had a number of kids that had uh, pretty severe uh, both physical and mental uh, uh, disabilities. And so that was sort of my first touching of the community, if you will. But it wasn't until I got to the university, I actually majored in physics to begin with, and then um, uh, transferred to electrical engineering, both because I was extremely interested in, in the electrical part of engineering. Uh, also, my grandfather, uh, Morton Withy, had been the dean of the engineering school for quite a few years, and uh, he passed away my freshman year, but I know he really wanted me to consider going into engineering, so it wasn't too long after that that I made the change. The research I, researchers I was working with uh, at uh, the psychology department uh, uh, came with me to the draft board and, and uh, said, uh, you know, this fellow was working on a number of grants that we have, and if he's taken right now, it's going to cost us a lot of time and money to replace him and so on. So the, uh, the draft board uh, the next day uh, came back and said, as long as you're working on these projects, uh, I think you should stay in the United States. So, and it was really during that time that I, I learned about the deaf telecommunications network. Uh, there were several deaf people who were uh, part of some of the research that was going on. So they immediately began teaching me a lot more and also telling me a lot about their lives and uh, the, the issues that they had, one of which was using the telephone. Um, what had actually happened was a deaf man named Robert Whitebright, a physicist from Stanford, um, had uh, run into the same problem. And he was also a radio ham. And at that time, radio hams were using old teletype machines as part of their communication uh, means uh, in, in RTTY, or uh, radio, radio ham uh, teletype. And he figured out a way to connect it to the telephone line. And by the time I learned about this, there were probably 10 or 15,000 people in the United States using these TTY machines to type back and forth to each other to have telephone conversations. It came to mind that maybe we could make a TTY much smaller and all electronic, and uh, they could perhaps even portable, they could carry it around with them. I actually went to the store and bought a national semiconductor calculator, uh, tore the guts out of it, and put them in my own little printed circuit board that I made in my garage, and uh, put this computer chip on it along with a few other things, a, little, a couple of display chips. And lo and behold, we had a TTY in a calculator case. And it was fully operational. In fact, one of the fun things that happened was, how do we connect this thing to the telephone? I mean, we could make it all work, 
but physically, how do you connect this thing to the telephone? Because Ma Bell wouldn't let you connect directly in those days. You could not plug something into the telephone jack. No, no, that was totally forbidden. So you had to do it acoustically. You had to couple it acoustically. And I was at Kmart. And I was walking down the aisle just thinking about something else. And I saw a box or a bin of these little plastic coin purses. I looked at that for the longest thing, time and I thought, that's about the right size for the round, you know, handset earpiece and mouthpiece. So we stuck a, a speaker in one and a microphone in the other, and we opened it up a little bit further by snipping in a couple places, and uh, a couple small wires, and we plugged them into the calculator, and lo and behold, we had the coupler that actually you could carry around in your pocket. You could hook it onto any telephone, and away you go, typing away on the keyboard and reading a message coming back. We called it the VIP, okay, the Visual Information Processor. And of course, everybody who got one thought it was a very important person, and that helped it. So I took it to a, uh, a convention, and I was putting out some brochures and, and a couple of the devices. And I turned around, and there were like 30 deaf people. They're all signing and pointing and pointing at the thing and getting excited, you know. And they were pointing at me and signing to me. Well, at that point in time, I was not nearly a good enough signer to understand what they were doing because they were in full-blown sign language, you know, not spelling it, just boom, you know. And within minutes, it was clear that these people were very excited because now they could have the equivalent in those days of a TTY that was really a cell phone, if you will. It was a portable telephone, and they'd never seen anything like that before. So very quickly after that, um, the orders began to pour in for it. Uh, we were making them in the basement, my wife and I and another engineer that I was working with, who's still in, with the company. Um, and um, that started the whole thing rolling. Uh, we set up our own uh, technology center, which is currently located uh, here in the park. Uh, we employ about 200 people there now. Uh, they make about a half a million devices a year. All of our stuff is made here. Uh, nothing is assembled outside of, uh, of the U.S. or of Madison. Uh, but we also make a number of products for other people. Uh, including other disability products, but also commercial products. When all was said and done, I think we had designed over 200 different TTY, or what are then what are now known as text phone devices. Okay, all different shapes and sizes and colors, uh, 25 or 30 different countries, 15 different languages. Uh, one of the things that I had uh, had in my mind for a long, long time, in fact, almost since the beginning was that although the TTYs were sort of interesting, they were clearly archaic technology. And even though we could build them all electronically and we could make them look kind of neat and maybe make them do more things, you still are basically typing to someone else and they're typing back to you. But when the caption telephone uh, became a, a product and a service uh, that was accepted on a national basis, which it has been, it's been approved by the FCC for use throughout the country, and all the states now also provided. Wisconsin was one of the first, and I'm happy to see the success, although I'll tell you the truth, uh, I would be happy to come into work every day anyway, as I always have, because it's really the work that's the fun part. My wife, Sue, I met her at the University of Wisconsin. She was a freshman, I was a sophomore, and we both had the same chemistry section. Of course, uh, started seeing each other, and. Uh, uh, as soon as she graduated, we got married and uh, had two fine boys. Uh, my son Christopher, who was finishing his PhD out in, uh, at UCLA in the linguistic anthropology. Um, he's actually working now with people with severe communicative disorders. He's using caption telephone technology to caption the speech of the hearing party, and for that matter, to capture the, the whole conversation. And he puts it up on the screen for the person who has the uh, physical disability uh, to choose from. So now they can choose from words that are germane to the conversation at a much higher probability than they would if it just trying to randomly spell it or take it from a dictionary. So needless to say, dads are proud of that. <laughs> and my other son, Timothy, has uh, just uh, uh, completed his uh, work in law school out in Philadelphia. I uh, actually got another degree in law out there and uh, after working there for a year has come back and is now general counsel here at Ultratech and helping us with some of our contractual issues and so on. And we're very happy to have him back helping us out as well. So it's great. Anyway, the whole family's involved. Sue is still the uh, 
CFO. Uh, she takes care of that side of the house, and uh, I still get my hands into the technology side, so it works out pretty well. You never expect anything like this to happen to you. You don't, you know, I mean, who would think, you know? Um, but it's great. I mean, it's, it's humbling, and it's, it's, uh, it's just a terrific honor. And, and I also understand uh, very clearly that uh, these kinds of things happen not because of just one person's work, but because of a lot of really good people's work. It's just amazing that you have, you know, this many talented people for this long of a period of time who stay with you because they believe in what they're doing and what we're all doing. And I just get to be the guy who stands up and says thanks, you know. So, okay. Well, thank you for coming today. It was wonderful having you here. And a pleasure. I hope to see you again.